You likely know the story of the Enola Gay and the world's first nuclear strike on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. That was a mission that, somewhat remarkably, went entirely according to plan. But it's the story of the second nuclear strike, only three days later on August 9, 1945, that's even more remarkable. Because this mission seemed to teeter almost entirely on the brink of nuclear calamity. Major Charles W. Sweeney was the pilot of Boxcar, a purpose-built, not modified, nuclear strike variant of the B-29 Super Fortress. These nuclear strike bombers, the first ever and the only nuclear strike aircraft in history to be used operationally, were codenamed Silver Plate. The problems for Boxcar began before the aircraft even left the ground. A fuel system malfunction meant that 600 gallons of gas trapped in a rear tank could not be accessed due to an electrical problem. Boxcar would have to fly the mission with 6,400 gallons of aviation fuel, not the planned 7,000 gallons. This first problem would magnify into more problems, nearly altering the destiny of human history. The second nuclear strike mission originally targeted Kokura, but would be flown with a different nuclear weapon than the Hiroshima bomb. The 10,300 pound weapon named Fat Man, was significantly more powerful than the little boy weapon used at Hiroshima just three days before. But Fat Man was a much more dangerous weapon than little boy, and it was more powerful. The construction and fusing of Fat Man meant that the weapon would be armed when Major Sweeney and his entire crew took off. Different from little boy, it was actually armed in the air. Sweeney was concerned that if we crashed on takeoff, we could obliterate the entire island. Bad weather also plagued the second nuclear strike mission. There was turbulence and it caused the already underfueled boxcar to have to climb to 17,000 feet, requiring more fuel than originally planned, even though the crew took off with the excess fuel that they couldn't use trapped in the back of the aircraft. The next four hours did pass somewhat uneventfully out over the Pacific in the dark, but then, a series of red warning lights on instrumentation indicated that several of Fat Man's circuits were now actually armed. The diagnostics did not differentiate between the circuits that were altitude triggered or time triggered. If these circuits were time triggered, Fat Man would detonate in the air in only 43 seconds. Crewman Phil Barnes managed to fix the problem before the time limit expired. Sweeney's crew in Boxcar was supposed to rendezvous with Lieutenant Colonel James Hopkins in a B-29 en route to Kokura. But Hopkins was never at the rendezvous point. He never showed up and he couldn't be found. Sweeney orbited the rendezvous area for nearly an hour, contributing to his already escalating fuel crisis. Hopkins' B-29 never did show up for the rendezvous, and Sweeney was eventually forced to continue his mission, but now, another hour late, with an even greater fuel crisis. Boxcar arrived on target over Kokura to find it was completely obscured by clouds, defended by heavy flak, and at least 10 Japanese zeros. It couldn't have been more different than Colonel Paul Tibbet's strike on Hiroshima. Now, with fuel critically low in Boxcar, and the primary target, Kokura, nearly impossible to attack visually, Major Sweeney and his crew diverted to their secondary target, the city of Nagasaki. There may have been enough fuel for one attack run if the target was not obscured by clouds or heavily defended by anti-aircraft guns and Japanese fighters. Sweeney's crew did have the capability to bomb by radar, but the overwhelming priority was to bomb visually, both for accuracy and for bomb damage assessment. So now, with their fuel emergency worsening, and a safe return to their home base at Tinian impossible, Sweeney and his crew may be able to make the emergency landing area at Okinawa, a place where lost, damaged, and fuel-starved B-29s could make an unplanned diversion. But they also might not make it. As Boxcar approached Nagasaki, the city lay concealed under an 80% blanket of cloud cover. Sweeney agonized over bombing by radar, eventually understanding it was his only alternative. Trying to fly the nuclear-armed B-29 back to a friendly base, even an emergency base at Okinawa, 
was impossible due to the extra weight of the bomb on board the aircraft. Descending below the bomb's air burst detonation altitude of 1,910 feet risked the bomb going off. Losing the bomb at sea was not an option. Bop, boxcar had to drop Fat Man, then Nagasaki would be the place. As Sweeney and his crew began their bomb run, they had only 300 gallons of fuel remaining. If they bombed on their first run over Nagasaki, executed their anti-blast clearing turn, and flew directly to Okinawa, there remained a distant chance that they may make it home. Just as the crew began their radar-guided bomb run, an opening in the clouds appeared, and the fate of approximately 60,000 Japanese in Nagasaki was sealed. Boxcar transitioned to visual bombing and delivered Fat Man accurately on target at 11.01 local time. With only seconds to spare, the crew of Boxcar spots Okinawa. Just as their first of four engines dies from fuel starvation, Sweeney continues his one-chance landing approach on only three engines. And seconds after he touches down on the threshold of Okinawa, a second engine runs out of fuel. As the giant bomber rolls out at the end of the runway, a third engine quits out of gas. And by the time Boxcar rolls to a stop, there's only seven gallons of fuel left. The mission had taken 20 hours since takeoff.